Hello, everyone, and welcome to the February presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. Once again, I'm Ben Woodbury with the Friends and will serve as your host. Before we begin today's presentation, here are a few administrative details. Uh, first of all, a reminder, all recent, past, and future First Wednesday online lectures are now available on the Friends of History web page, shown below. Just click on the lecture series link at the top of the homepage. Our monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with the support from the New Mexico History Museum. We do, however, accept and encourage donations. These funds will go directly go to support the lecture series and more importantly, all history museum programs and exhibits. Should you wish to make a donation, just go to our website and click on the donate button at the top of the page. We'd like to draw your attention to our next two upcoming lectures. On March 2nd, Gordon Bernitsky will speak on Miguel Trujillo, New Mexico's unknown civil rights hero. And on April 6th, Tom Leach, the just retired director of the Palace Press, will present an overview of the New Mexico History Museum's recently acquired Gustav Bauman archive. If you wish to learn more about these lectures and all upcoming lectures, we urge you to join our mailing list if you have not already done so, either via our webpage or by emailing us at the link below. Now, for today's lecture, we're fortunate to have Ms. Hannah Ab Abelbeck, photo archivist for the Palace of the Governor's Photo Archives, who will serve as our speaker today. She talks on Sam Adams, an African-American Civil War veteran and his New Mexican life. Hannah has a BA in English and Art History from the University of Kansas and an MA in English from the Penn State University. She's worked on special collections at both of these universities. She researches Southwestern, especially New Mexico, photographers, documentary and vernacular photography, cultural movements, and histories of gender and sexuality. At the New Mexico History Museum, she is working on increasing digital access to the museum's vast photo collections. I want to personally thank Hannah today, who on short notice offered to be this month's speaker. Notably, her topic is particularly appropriate as we celebrate African American History Month. Following the presentation, Hannah will answer any questions you may have. Your questions and comments can be posted at any time in the YouTube chat room, both during and after the presentation. As always, upon completion of today's event, the entire presentation will be posted on the Friends of History webpage, as well as on the History Museum's YouTube and Facebook pages. So let us now welcome Ms. Hannah Abelbeck. Hi, everybody. I'm Hannah Abelbeck, photo archivist at the New Mexico History Museum. It's February, so it's Black History Month. And I'm only talking today because I have a new piece on Sam Adams. 
in the current, that is winter 2021 issue of El Palacio. I first became aware of these portraits of an African-American man identified only as Samuel Adams around 2015. At the time, New Mexico History Museum curators were preparing for an exhibit called Fading Memories, Echoes of the Civil War. It was the 150th anniversary of the end of the war. And in our collections, we had a surprising lack of images that were specific to the conflict as it played out here. Our images were negatives. They'd been printed, but they had not been digitized. So when I went to look at them, I pulled them physically and the envelopes had a tantalizing statement that linked Adams to the Civil War. However, none of the images were picked or reproduced for the exhibit. And that was because the timeline didn't allow for research that would confirm any link between Adams and the Civil War or that it would explain and contextualize it. Last month's friend speaker, Mary Kate Nelson highlighted that New Mexico's Civil War history is often peripheral to what is taught about the era, especially elsewhere, which is one reason why this image stood out to me and why I remembered it and wanted to revisit it later. The images that are in photo archives are negatives on glass. And I'm going to linger there for a minute. There are all these ways that problems around the negative and the positive, around black and white, around highlights and shadows, around the subject and object of a photo, make really interesting metaphors for thinking about Sam Adams' portraits. Many Civil War histories here in New Mexico have focused on the alliance between Euro-American newcomers and the Hispano elite. There are other ways to look at it. Nelson's research looked at three corners, the North, the South, and Native America. Another new book about 1860s New Mexico, Hardship, Greed, and Sorrow, which features an 1866 album from photo archives also looks at three conflicts slightly later the civil war u.s military actions against native american inhabitants and across the southern border the conflict in mexico the second franco america franco mexican war also known as the french intervention very few accounts center African-American experiences in the Southwest during this time. And the exception is units of Buffalo soldiers who arrived overland on the Santa Fe Trail in 1866. However, Adams was not, it turns out, a member of one of these colored regiments. In other words, Adams is in the middle of, but peripheral to these stories. How he fits is as a counterpoint, um, perhaps a negative to major narratives. That perspective, that fact in itself can be revealing. What happens when you put someone marginal at the center? What if you highlight the shadows? What if things aren't so black and white? How complicated and rich was our past? The series of images of Sam Adams is uncommon, at least compared to other sets of material in our collections. First, we don't have much material that features African-American subjects in the 19th century. And furthermore, these images of Adams aren't studio portraits commissioned by him, which is the most common reason people were photographed. 
strangely, this seems to be an on location photo shoot. <laughs> Secondly, we didn't inherit prints, you know, that someone bought or commissioned. We have the negatives. We have five and they weren't bundled as part of a huge set of negatives from a photo studio. They came from a New Mexico historian, Ralph Emerson Twitchell. And then <laughs> there's this, you know, length of time, right? Civil War context, Civil War importance, but photos from 1915. The connection's this, I think. A note on the envelope connected Adams to the Civil War, but also noted that Mrs. Dendall of Santa Fe was assisting Adams, um, helping him with finances, you know, bureaucratic paperwork, um, around securing his pension from his Civil War service. The site choice for these photographs, Pecos, reinforces that connection having been a key location for events during the Civil War around the Battle of Glorieta Pass. Another reason for an on-location photo shoot. This all seems pretty deliberate. And thinking uh, as someone who works with historical photographs, which photographer was able to take photographs outside at Pecos during that time? You know, yeah, people can take photographs in 1915, but it's still a lot of work, still a lot of work to do it on location. And Jesse Nussbaum was able to do it. That year, he was working on a School of American Archaeology excavation and reconstruction of the Mission Church. On the left is a detail of an image from the set of Nussbaum's photographs, wait, uh, <laughs> it's an image from the set of, of Sam Adams' photographs, so you can see Adams alongside workers doing the digging. And for comparison, on the right is a 1915 issue of El Palacio, which discusses Nussbaum's work at Pecos, and it also reproduces a photo by Jesse Nussbaum, a glass negative of which can be found in the photo archives collections. This is why I've attributed the Adams portraits to Nussbaum, although it probably deserves an asterisk, more work is, could be warranted to confirm Nussbaum or eliminate the Twitchells or Dundals as creators of the photographs. Instead of working the photo side, <laughs> one can work the record side. And one of the first records I found confirming that Sam Adams was connected to the Civil War was from his death. He was buried in the Santa Fe National Cemetery. This record confirmed that Adams had served with the 1st Colorado Cavalry. And the 1st Colorado played a major role in defeating the Confederate Texans at the Battle of Glorieta Pass. When I contacted him to ask for leads on records about Sam Adams, one Colorado historian expressed skepticism that a black man would have served with the quote, all white volunteers. Yet while the dates are fuzzy, by 1864, Adams shows up inconsistently, but still repeatedly in company records. Still, it didn't quite connect for me. Serving in Colorado towards the end of the conflict is still a bit of a stretch for an outdoor Pecos photo shoot, as the activity there was in 1862, and maybe Sam Adams wasn't even there. So I had this question, is there more to the story? I haven't turned over every stone. There are a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and through all the digging I did, there's actually not much I can say about Adams before the Civil War. I don't know his birthday, his parents or siblings, whether he was born enslaved or free, how he got to Colorado, never mind what he thought, hoped, or dreamed. 
In terms of him speaking for himself, he didn't write. When traces of his life appear, it is clear that others did the recording and it was usually for their purposes, not his. So in the case of this 1864 enlistment record, everything was written for him and about him. What he did here was add his mark right there between his first and last name. For how difficult it was to find any traces of Adams, I found this bit of ink quite poignant. I'm not gonna get into much more detail about Adam's service. Um, you know, it could be really interesting stuff if Nussbaum or Twitchell interviewed him and took notes after talking to him in 1915. I don't know about them. It's also worth saying that 100 years ago, from 2015, <laughs> 1915, right, would be the 50th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. And it was probably a good occasion for a historian like Twitchell to be thinking about those events that year and for Newsbound to think about them while excavating at the site. Just like I've said that African-American troops in New Mexico weren't alone in the territory, um, Adams was not the only African-American man connected with the first Colorado either. And I'm going to talk about that to maybe raise some questions about Adam's experiences. Um, I'm gonna talk about Jim Beckworth, his contemporary. You know, black soldiers on the American frontier were often agents and allies of an empire who treated them as second-class citizens. Adams was probably enlisted while the troops he was serving massacred Cheyenne and Arapaho people at Sand Creek in Southeast Colorado on November 29, 1864. Jim Beckworth, a well-known frontiersman of African-American heritage was at Sand Creek that day. A generation older than Adams, he was born to an enslaved woman in Virginia and freed by his father and owner in Missouri. Despite working as a scout and a translator for the Colorado Infantry, Beckworth later expressed regret for the role he played at Sand Creek and testified against Colonel John M. Shivington during a congressional inquiry in 1865. The events at Sand Creek and Bosque Redondo <laughs> and Beckworth and Adams go to the heart of the controversy around the Santa Fe Plaza obelisk, which commemorates not only the North-South conflict, but the much longer period where Union soldiers focused on territorial expansion and control of resources, often at the expense of Indigenous peoples. What does it mean to have this kind of connection and, to and perspective on these events? What does it mean to be a Black cook for Shivington's troops? As I mentioned, the winter 2021 issue of El Palacio has the piece I wrote on Sam Adams. In addition to delving into a few more details about Adams service records, the second half of the piece talks a lot more about his New Mexican family. It features some stuff about family dynamics, genealogy, and heritage. And this stuff is interesting and complicated, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the details here. But in short, after his time with the Colorado Volunteers, there are some hints that Adams may have married into Taos circles, um, maybe to a woman in Taos named Eva Martine, haven't found that. Um, about a decade passes 
where I couldn't find much about him. And then he moves to the Cerrillos Galisteo area. There he marries a local Hispanic woman named Timotea Chavez. Her descendants are still around. One of them, Robert Quintana Hopkins, did a companion piece in El Palacio with mine. Um, and we also talked together on the podcast Encounter Culture about his family and about uh, Black and Latino identity. But in the end, it turns out Adams was not only tangentially <laughs> connected to the events at Pecos, he was a New Mexican for about 50 or 60 years, living mostly within 60 miles or less of the Pecos site. The family has some stories, kind of, about Adams. Not really. <laughs> what was passed down is either absent or inconsistent. And I will note that even the records I could find aren't all that right. Um, and I'll just give you two examples um of census records um this is their family enumerated 10 years apart um in the first one sam adams is in bland and i'll return to that record in a minute but timote is there on the first line and she's listed as white and the children in the family is black in the next census 1910 it's kind of a mess. Not even Adams is spelled right. And Sam Adams is listed as white. <clears throat> so there are several children in the family and their stories are also difficult to learn about. Um, most of the descendants I've spoken with are related to Cleo Tilda Quintana, also known as Tilly Chavez. Uh, the photo on the right is from <laughs> those family members. And while we wanted to put this photo in the article, it didn't have quite enough resolution for print, but fortunately it works fine online. Um, and the image I used for the title slide, you know, we called Sam Adams with a child. <laughs> Uh, we thought about it, and we're still not sure what child appeared with Sam in the Pecos photo shoot. It could have been a child related to an archaeologist, Nussbaum, etc., or a child related to a laborer at the excavation. Um, but a very promising option could be a child of the family or an extended family member. We were not able to confirm this. Um, a son of the family, Isabel, could have been about 15, and this child does not look 15. Um, I haven't talked directly to many descendants of Isabel's, but a number of them live in the Las Vegas area. Tilly, who is uh, shown close up below, would have been around 11 or 12 in 1915. Uh, we didn't feel like any of this was clear enough to make a connection. <clears throat> it would be very interesting to hear from descendants of other siblings. Um, Robert, uh, who is descended from Tilly, and I have speculated that some of the children in the family are more likely to have been biological children of Sam Adams than others. And it would be interesting to see if they have different or more active oral histories about Sam Adams or about this time. In the El Pal piece, I tried to push open a door to talk about what seems to have been a potential moment of possibility for African Americans in New Mexico territory, right, between the end of the Civil War and the failure of Reconstruction. And what that could have meant for Afro Nuevo Mexicano possibilities. In a departure from the El Pal piece, I'm going to talk more about the contemporaries of Adams, people who are more traditionally <laughs> uh, centered in Black history, um, and contemporaries of children in his family. 
It turns out that Adams is almost never the only African American person in his community. And I think that's worth pointing out. Rather than just being a few banner events told separately and as exceptions, African American history in New Mexico is quiet and very fragmented, but it is also present and persistent when you look for it. Here, for example, is the 1900 census where Adams is living apart from Timotea and the children. Um, he's earning money wood chopping in the boom town of Bland. On the next line below his appears to be his lodger, Martin Brooks, a younger black man and teamster born in Tennessee. So I'm gonna connect him to a bigger bigger potential story, right? Instead of disconnected stories, I've already mentioned James Beckworth and the US colored troops stationed in New Mexico from 1866 to 1869. But I'll just list a few other actually very notable African American figures whose lives overlapped with Adams. George McJunkin, pictured on the top left, also known as an African-American cowboy, famous for being an amateur archeologist, paleontologist, who understood that the Folsom site would, was significant in terms of, of you know, being worthy of excavation. Um, William James Slaughter, pictured on the lower left with his family, was a prominent Santa Fe citizen. Um, the last, Frank Boyer, is most famous for ha helping found Blackdom. Um, he would have been about the same age as the Teamster listed with Adams and Bland. Uh, Frank Boyer's father was a Buffalo soldier stationed in New Mexico. You'll notice that most of the names on these slides are men. If the history of Black laboring men is hard to recover, just try to tell stories about their female contemporaries. In trying to put Sam Adams and his children in context, uh, one source I hit upon was the book Concha, which is a biography that is geographically connected to and overlaps with the Adams Chavez family. Um, they don't appear. Um, but the book features a few stories of African American residents of the Galisteo area. This image from the book shows a young woman named Adela. Her story ended kind of tragically with a car accident on La Bajada. But its existence shows lives that were possible, even if she's not the main character of this book. What does her story say? What would you ask her if you could? Another account from the book features Bluebell, a childhood friend of Concha's. Hearing her story from this book is fascinating. If you read it skeptically and think, would Bluebell have seen it this way? This photo shows her and her sister, and if you're really good at using ancestry, you can find that she went on to lead kind of an interesting life. And it would be remarkable if someone could tell her story. You don't even need to like make up alternative histories <laughs> to talk about black history in New Mexico. The history and impact of African Americans who lived in New Mexico during the past is vital. But when we do history here, maybe because of the tricultural myth, maybe because we aren't looking, it's relatively buried. And that's a shame because putting these folks in context and conversation can be really, really interesting. On the left is an unidentified African-American woman who did pose for a studio portrait in Albuquerque. We don't know her name. 
the image in the top center shows a crowd coming to see Teddy Roosevelt give a speech. Um, in the front, right next to his arm, <laughs> you can see this young African American person has pushed his way to the front. Um, if you look for that kind of thing, you can see it. Uh, on the top right, here's an image from Santa Rosa that shows a family restaurant staff. One of their staff is African American, and on the bottom is a, a sort of farmer's market truck farm crew, and one of the people who works there is African American on the far right. Um, what I'm hoping you see here is an invitation to take Black history seriously and to look for it everywhere and all year round, because it can be really, really interesting. Anna, thank you very much you know, for sharing your work, uh, a most detailed effort, both to capture the life of Sam Adams and uh, determine insights that this work offers uh, the African-American community in, in New Mexico. For our audience, as we start this Q&A session, I want to encourage you to type in any questions and comments on the lecture you may have into the chat room stream on the YouTube and or Facebook pages where you are viewing this presentation. As we await these uh, comments and questions, uh, I have a couple of questions to and hopefully generate some discussion. Anna, I'm struck by the detailed research you've undertaken to try to parse out the basic eight outlines of Sam Adams' life. I particularly appreciated your detailed analysis of the five Sam Adams photos in the museum collection, and then building on that information to seek out additional, more traditional documentary evidence of the life of this man, such as pension records, the burial records, and census data. It certainly highlights the challenges researchers like yourself face in seeking to gain a better understanding uh, of a person's life uh, beyond his or her genealogical data. Do you have any thoughts you, you, as to the potential additional information sources which would help in the research of such American, uh, African American lives and, and their contributions to New Mexico history? Yeah, well, I think um, you know part of my answer is going to come um, from my perspective as an archivist. Um, you know, we, you know, we, I hit up the sources I knew that were going to provide the, the most promising leads, right? Those And those are vital records. So obvious census data. Um, and because uh, the military keeps good records, <laughs> um, military records, right? Um, I actually talked to uh, someone who loves military history and told me he loves it because you can actually find information <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, when you find a photograph, you can, you can actually find information about you know, the background story. Um, and the other, again, most promising thing is to talk to family members to see if they've inherited any personal property or, or oral histories. Um, you can find things beyond that, of course, but um, you have to do a, a lot more work. And I think particularly for people who aren't regarded Especially when you know when historical records are being compiled, when they're not regarded as significant, a lot of that stuff just just goes away. So you know, if you find something, it seems miraculous, <laughs> um, and that would you know it would be by accident that that someone kept a record or saved a record, and especially made it available or accessible in, in a way that that someone looking could find it right there there could be there could be a photo owned by a neighbor 
But in order to, to make a good guess about where it is in 2022, you'd have to ask questions like, who was that neighbor? Who was their descendants? <laughs> is it worth tracking them down? Do they have it in a storage unit, right? So, um, you know, my, my, my plea would be, you know, if you want history, um, you, have to, you have to do actively, active work to create it and to preserve it. Um, and so there are many, many things you can do as an individual, but you know, supporting cultural institutions and, and, and archives can also help um, make sure that stories you want to keep aren't lost. Uh, th uh, thank you. Um, I, I have to comment that uh, I come from a large uh, family that maintains a lot of contact and we've certainly faced the same challenges in terms of trying to preserve the history of several generations uh, of, uh, across the border. And uh, uh, it's both an opportunity and a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, of additional African-American individuals whose photos you highlight at the end of your talk, do you have any thoughts as to which of these people or of other people whose personal histories could potentially add to the, the story of this poorly understood uh, community? Um, you know, the, the, the photos I showed, um, you know, we, we don't have information about any of those individuals. Um, so it becomes very hard to, to recover their story other than, you know, you can start asking questions, right? Knowing, <laughs> knowing that someone worked for a restaurant in Santa Rosa, you might be able to ask questions about that business and see if, there, see if there's anything left of that story. Um, I, I, another promising way to start is to talk to descendants of people who were here. Um, and you know there are there are some individual researchers who do work on African American history in New Mexico, and there's of course the African American Museum in Albuquerque um, that really centers these stories, um, and they might have ideas too about work that needs to be done. Um, but I I know from experience too that that you know many descendants of folks that. African American people that were here in in the 19th century and early in the 20th century, you know, their descendants may live elsewhere, um, and it sometimes becomes hard to um, connect those, you know, dispersed stories back to events that happened here. You know, even even you know Robert, who I who I talked with about his family story and oral history on Sam Adams, lives in California. So um, sometimes those stories exist, but but they're not in the state anymore. Um, and it would be great to, to reconnect um, some of those descendants with, with hi active history here. Looking on the off chance there'll be some additional questions, but I did want to comment to you and to the audience that uh, uh, I, the, the, of the uh, highlight, the additional online resources that are available just as a consequence of the work that you've been doing. Uh, not only your online El, El Palacio article, which is readily accessible, um, and the companion piece, the Understanding Black Mexican Identities by Robert Quintana, who you, who you were work, work, work in, in considerable contact with um, over the course of your research, um, is also available um, uh, on uh, the El Palacio webpage. Uh, uh, finally, um, there is the, the you, the link to uh, Quintana's own master's thesis, which draws on uh, the information that he's been collecting over the years and provides an academic perspective on, uh, on that. Uh, we're going to post these on a, uh, at, at the conclusion of the Q&A. Uh, they're also, I saw, are available on the uh, Facebook uh, uh, chat area and uh, um, as well. So um, I'll reach out to, uh, uh, Kathleen and Chris, uh, were there any additional questions? Uh, no, there aren't. That's okay. it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Hannah, uh, we are going to post this, and I'm sure people will read with, with interest. Uh, and so we certainly much appreciated you giving us this time on such short notice uh, to, you know, to, to make this presentation. It's been most informative uh, and stimulating. So Thanks, Ben. You're welcome.
have a good day. And same to all of our audience. Uh, thank you again for, for being part of this.